Hark the bardic paladin who sings and plays again. He tells the tales of glory and weaves a magic story. He'll join you at your table and ask you to share a fable. Heroes of humble origin, villains who must be fought again. No matter their skill or prowess, the people in life are countless. So we pray you heed our request. Enjoy this tale of sidekicks and sidequests. Sidequests and sidequests. And sidequests and sidequests. Episode 17 The Creation of Elves and Gnomes. Welcome to Sidekicks and Sidequests, the Dungeons and Dragons podcast that helps to put humans back into humanity and breathe life into your campaign NPCs with backstory and bravado. That's right, we're building a world, one character at a time. I am your host, Kurt Krenwelge, the Bardic Paladin, and welcome to the Levitating Platter. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to another in-between week edition of Sidekicks and Side Quests. I went to the polls once again, trying to determine what it was that you would like to hear this week, and actually had a tie, so I had to do a second poll to figure out what it was, and the winner of that poll was that you wanted to hear more homebrew lore npc content i feel like i must apologize to those of you who aren't necessarily interested in my homebrew lore as it were but i feel it gives you a two-for-one deal since you're getting npcs in the form of deities that you could choose to use in your game and it helps me to think more on my lore and how to continue to improve my setting. As I'm currently, at this time, not playing Dungeons and Dragons due to the age and time of coronavirus. So, I'm just fixing my notes. So, as I looked down the list of what was the next group of player character ancestries to tackle, I realized we hadn't talked about elves and gnomes. And so, elves and gnomes are a little different in my setting, and I hope that you will find them interesting as we get into the discussion of them. I'm going to try to discuss the elves first and what's applicable to them, and then I will conclude with gnomes. So, hope you enjoy as we dive into the creation of elves and gnomes. The Elves when the Kantikum was sounded and Monena began to form the Kantu Fei, there was a moment in the Song of Creation that pleased the Satur, and out of that resonance and the harmonics of the notes came the first elves, not made by Monena nor any of the other begotten. Elves owe their existence to the Satur, though few elves remember this. Because of the way in which they arose, elves are sensitive to the power from the Kantikum and their worship of deities. As they began to find gods to worship, they saw that they began to change, taking on the physical appearances and traits of those same gods. Multiple generations of elves who continued to worship the same gods saw that their children were born with these divine traits, and thus the formation of the different elven tribes began. Those elves who followed Monena became the first wood elves, for they tended to her creation and lived in accord with nature. Those elves who remained in the Kantu Fei became the first Aladrin for the changing of the seasons, the weaving, the waving, the warping of the fanciful realm influenced their very being. Those who turned to the moon goddess Orbissa became the first moon elves and would see themselves made to imitate the moon goddess and their looks and their style and their architecture. And those who turned to the sun god Hedos became the first sun elves as they took on a regal appearance and were made as magnificent as the sun itself. At the Caesarea, those who listened to Golnar became the first drow, or dark elves. To this day, 
Elves can be found worshipping any number of deities, and there are even rumors that communities of earthen or fire elves exist, but those gods who made them died during the Caesarea. The same malleability that first formed the major tribes still allows for individual elves to take on unique features and traits based on their piety with the deity of their choosing. So to kind of help put it into context, my wife's character in our home game is a wood elf from a place called the Enchanted Forest, which has a portal to Kantu Fey in the center of it. And so the story goes with uh, her backstory with her people is that they're all dominant wood elves, but there are Eladrin, there are fey creatures that come from the Kantu Fey to deal with politics in the mortal realm. And so there's a particular city where this mixed militaristic and druidic society resides since the enchanted forest is kind of set as a border region between the badlands to the north and some mountains to the west the sea to the east and grasslands to the south so they're kind of right in the middle of competing factions other groups who are trying to either subjugate the enchanted forest or be able to go through but the elves of the enchanted forest have a very strong presence a long roundabout way to explain that the druids of the forest who stay true to the goddess Monena look more earthy. You know, they have more foliage and green and darker copper colors and stuff. They appear to emulate the nature goddess Monena herself, the more devout that you are. But also there are those within the society who worship a ancestor, a patron of theirs, a proto wood elf, sort of, if you will, probably an Eladrin type figure, but nevertheless, someone who still resides within the Feywild and led or encouraged this particular tribe of wood elves to make the journey from the Feywild into the Kantu Vita a long time ago. The military, for her character background, basically still worship this fey creature, and so they look more exaggerated and more otherworldly in their features as they give patronage to this particular ancestor of theirs, most likely a ladron or just fey lord or creature. And if you are more in line with nature, then you would take on a more natural, earthy, dryad, maybe kind of like appearance if you were to worship Monena. Another example that I came up with for one of my player characters, he's a human cleric from a different continent within my home game that we haven't explored yet. I thought of a really neat group to be associated with his church since he is a cleric of Amethon, you know, the human god of the dawn and farming and agriculture. So there is a elven group called the Dawn Guard. And these are basically the Swiss guard for the high temple dedicated to Amethyn in the continent of Vendra. These are a band of elves who worship the Sightbringer. They have golden blonde hair and sunrise colored eyes. They seem to glow with an internal radiance. And they're a community of high elves who live in the mountains who swore an oath to the god Amethyn to protect the seat of religious governance and the high priest for the high temple of Amethyn. Since the empire in this character's background houses the temple it creates a tension with the imperial house and occasionally there are rebellions from provinces and invasions by foreign nations that necessitate that a neutral to human politics yet aligned to the god guarding force would exist to ensure the survival of the worship of amethon so those are some examples from my home game of how this concept of the malleability of elves works out and kind of as I mentioned in the story, it goes the opposite way. I mean, this doesn't just affect elves if they worship good or neutral gods. It also works if they worship evil gods. And so the prime example, certainly from Dungeons and Dragons, is that there are dark elves or drow. And so my take on the goddess of the drow is named Golnar. She is the goddess of spiders, matriarchy, and heresy, and she is one of the corrupted gods. She is one of the dissonant. Her alignment is lawful evil, and she resides in Heresis, the sixth circle, the circle of heresy. Her titles are Weaver of Discord, Matriarch Supreme. Her symbol is a black widow spider. 
The story of Golnar is that she was the first ancient elf to embrace darkness and chaos at the Caesarea and ascend to corrupted godhood. She appears as a beautiful and powerful female, but has spider eyes and mandibles for a mouth with razor sharp teeth, and her lower half is all a gigantic black widow spider. She has acidic saliva and a poison and paralyzing stinger. She is enchanting and terrifying. She hatches monstrous spider creatures and demons from her back by feeding on the souls in her circle, the sixth circle of hell, the circle of heresy. Her story is that she helped to spread the news and knowledge of the dissonant to mortals. She proclaimed that all the other gods and goddesses and the Sator were not to be trusted and followed. She delights in the spreading of lies, falsehoods, heresy, and misinformation especially when done for advancement or personal gain. She believes that goddesses are superior to gods, and therefore she views herself first among her equals, though she does fear the power that Uzrasha wields since Uzrasha began the Caesarea. She delights in bringing down men and subjugating them. She encourages backstabbing and betrayal. She would gladly kill any other goddess or god if it meant that she could gain more power. She enjoys her playthings, aka the drow, and anyone else who would pay her homage. She led the elven ancestors who became the drow into the Underdark, where they would worship her, and through their generations of worshipping her, they changed and permanently gained the racial abilities and limitations that drow have. So this means that drow will always stay drow, but those who apostatize from Golnar can still reflect the qualities of those other gods. She hates when men are better, or she hates male gods. And she seeks to have punished those who rebuke her greatness or flaunt or boast of their own merits or powers that she brought about. So there you go. That is the explanation of Elves of My Setting. Again, they were created out of the act of creation and because of this they have malleability the ancestors of the elves are the mechanical explanation over generations of worship of particular gods that have led to the dedicated sub races that exist mechanically within dungeons and dragons but in my setting it is possible based on your piety with your concordance with a god that you could actually take on characteristics of the deity that you choose to worship whether for good or ill so if an elf were to worship a good dragon deity figure then they could take on dragon characteristics if an elf chose to worship a dwarven god then they could start taking on dwarven characteristics etc etc and now for gnomes Gnomes were created when Monena and the Dwarven gods shared a key theme, and their blended sound gave rise to the first three gnomes in Kantu Fei. The story goes that the first gnome loved Monena and nature, and was the ancestor to the forest gnomes. The second gnome liked to explore, have fun, and invent, and was the ancestor for the common rock gnome. The last gnome wanted to follow Aram and delve into the deep earth for precious jewels, and was the ancestor for the deep gnomes. The three gnomes went on to form their descendants, and thus there were three distinctive groups of gnomes, and they began to spread across the Kantus. At the Caesarea, as Eshkel and Shear were retreating into the Underdark, before they were banished, some of the deep gnomes heard the call of these dark gods and were transformed into the Darrow. This is how they were able to take on more dwarven appearances and speak dwarven. Listening to these dark gods drove them insane and caused them, along with the dwargar, to run amok in the Underdark. Originally, I had gnomes kind of like elves, but without the malleability, but I thought that wasn't a good enough story. So this is what I came up with as the explanation for gnomes, is that it's the blending of two different divine influences. So you have Monena, who is the goddess of nature, and you have the dwarven gods who are regarded as the elemental gods. And so by them kind of combining together, they in turn organically created gnomes, the first three gnomes, which had the distinctive forest, rock, and deep gnome sub-races. And I know that the 
Dungeons and Dragons material says that Darrow are smaller dwarves, but to me, in my opinion, they kind of look more gnomish. And so I thought it would make sense based on the lore that I've created that since they could be an offshoot of deep gnomes, that they were deep gnomes who instead of adhering to dwarven gods decided they were going to listen to Eshkel and Sheer and become corrupted like the Dwargar. And so Darrow, in my setting, I suppose possibly could be found alongside Dwargar, but it's not necessary. So yeah, I think that about covers it for elves and gnomes. Certainly it was a uh, an exercise for me to think through the lore and think of a good story and an explanation and a uniqueness to how elves and gnomes are presented in my home setting. And maybe this inspires you and you like this idea and you decide to take it into your next campaign. I certainly encourage it. Just be sure to write on our subreddit or tweet at me or send me an email. And let me know how it went. Again, I thank you for listening to this week's episode. I hope that you are doing all that you can to stay safe and to exercise your rights, especially if you're here in America. I know at the time of this recording, there is a national conversation going on concerning police brutality and systemic racism within our policing institutions. And so I know I haven't tried to be a person that scores political points or to make the issue all about me, Um, but I do want to say to those of you who are close to this issue, that I believe Black Lives Matter, and I am an authentic person trying to live out my faith, and I want you to know that I'm here to listen and to love you with all of my heart, all of my soul. And so stay strong. We will all get through this together. We will be the voice of change, and it begins with us. So when we can make the change, then we can change the world. So I encourage you all to stay safe, love each other, be kind, and have a great week. We'll see you next time with our next guest episode. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of Sidekicks and Side Quests. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast through Apple Podcast, Google Play, and Overcast, or feel free to save the RSS feed to use the app of your choice. Visit our website, HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash sidekicks and sidequests.com for links write-ups of the npcs and to learn more about the podcast to stay up to date and share your fan creations you can like and follow the podcast on social media by searching for at side kq podcast on facebook and twitter the podcast is also on reddit so join our subreddit community at r slash side kq podcast to share your art stories discussions and commentary if you'd like to hail the bard send an email to sidekicks and side quests all one word at gmail.com i ask that you please leave an honest review on itunes to help spread the word about the show sidekicks and side quests is unofficial fan content permitted under the fan content policy meaning i'm not approved or endorsed by wizards Portions of the materials used are property of Wizards of the Coast. Copyright, Wizards of the Coast, LLC. Thank you for your support, and I'll see you at the pub next time. Bar to rock on one, two, one, two, three, four!